Hello, and welcome to the Celebration Church Podcast. We are a faith-filled, family-focused church located in Lakeville, Minnesota. In a moment, you will hear a sermon from one of our pastors. We hope that you enjoy and grow closer to God through these messages. And now, for a message from our lead pastor, Derek Ross. Well, today is Palm Sunday, the beginning of Holy Week, and in a normal year, a normal setting, normal circumstances, we would be so thrilled to celebrate watching the children come in and waving palm branches and worship, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, and uh, that would still be appropriate today, and yet I must admit that this week and this month, this time that we're in is anything but normal, and Therefore, as the Lord would have it, we continue and then conclude today our series, Battle Ready. A famous evangelist once said, a preacher is a man through whom the voice of the infinite is made to be heard. And I felt that burden so strongly this week in my prayers for you and our times together today. My my spirit has felt that weight of the reality that today is the moment when the voice the infinite is made to be heard here today. So I ask the Lord to give me grace and strength to communicate that which I sense that he has written upon my heart for us today and for those who are here. Today is the final week of our Battle Ready series. And with everything I've felt this week, I suspect the enemy is trying to see if this was just another sermon series with a cute graphic or something that we mean business about. The word of God is so clear about this. By the way, this is introduction one of two. I've got two of them, a few passages of scripture. Then I'll get to the note sheet in a while. But the word of God is so clear about this that whenever we step out in faith to do great things for God, whenever we march forth and take back territory the enemy has erroneously occupied, whenever we begin to believe in greater ways For a mighty move of God, we should in fact expect opposition. For this is spiritual warfare. And as we've talked about each week, spiritual warfare is real and it's happening whether we believe it or not, whether we give words to acknowledge it or try to ignore it. The fact is every minion of hell is trying to thwart the plans of God. But aren't you glad this morning that greater is he that is within us than he that is in the world? We don't have to live in fear for we know we are victorious in Jesus Christ. So I came this morning to do that very thing and to in fact declare victory in the mighty name of Jesus. The word tells us that it's not by might and nor by power, but by the very spirit of the Lord that we experience victory in this life and for all of eternity. And with the things we've experienced this week in our local region and even in the lives of very faithful partners here at Celebration Church, I want you to know that I'm committed to practicing what I've been preaching. Because Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not uh, prevail against it. But I confess to you today, or I present to you uh, an admission from my heart that, that full of holy boldness, I'm tired of the church, I'm tired of Christians, I'm tired of pastors, I'm tired of myself simply guarding what is and not going after what he has next. Therefore, I believe it's time, well past time, in fact, for the church of Jesus Christ to move from simply playing defense and shift into offense. To advance the kingdom of God, yes, in our very lifetime, into places where darkness has resided for far too long. For the saints of God to boldly declare the kingdom of God is at hand. And it's in this spirit of desperation that I come to you this morning. Desperation brings you to a place where you utter prayers that your lips cannot muster. 
There comes a cry from your spirit that expresses a groaning beyond comprehension. And that desperation inside of me needs an outlet, so thanks for being here today for it. Welcome, my name's Derek, I'm the lead pastor, and next week is Easter, victory in Jesus. But today my spirit is burdened. You see, I've been praying for revival in our church and reformation in our land. And I believe that's a valid prayer for every Christ follower, every Bible believing, Jesus identifying human on the face of the earth for revival in our church and for reformation in our land. And I believe today will be a moment that marks our time together, a moment that we look back upon years from now and know that God met us here, that, that our trajectory was changed in the very presence of God. And before we leave, we're gonna have a moment of commissioning, really, as, as we give thanks to the Lord and we declare that we are battle ready. Amen. If you have your Bible, you could turn to Ephesians chapter six. If you're able, if you'd stand this morning, we're gonna read the same passage of scripture that we've been reading every week. Our text on spiritual warfare. Today is our final message, and today's message will focus in on the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Ephesians chapter number six, verses 10 and following, the Bible says, finally be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of the dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, verse 13, put on the full armor of God, so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything, to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, and with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take also the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. And pray in the Spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. With this in mind, be alert and always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. Pray also for me that whenever I speak, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel for which I'm an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it, declare it fearlessly as I should. I'm talking about the sword of the Spirit. Let's pray together this morning. Heavenly Father, we come to you and we say thank you for the awesome honor and privilege we've been given to lift high that mighty and matchless name of Jesus, the only name given among men under heaven by which we must be saved. So we ask, Holy Spirit, give us ears to hear what you're saying. Help us to obey courageously and march forth to shine your light in every dark place. And we ask it in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. Amen. You may be seated. As you can see on your note sheet today, we're talking about the sword of the spirit. Now there's five points, which some of you are wondering if the amount of points has any indication on how long the sermon will go. No, all of them are long. But there is five points and it goes with the word sword. So I'll just give you a hint. If you'd like to write down the first letter of every point, it's S-W-O-R-D. One, two, three, four, five. I'm not preaching on S words today. I'm preaching on the sword of the spirit. Over the past two months, we've been getting battle ready. We've been preparing to stand strong in the Lord. We've been getting equipped for spiritual warfare that is taking place right now. We've buckled the belt of truth around our waist as it holds everything else in place. We've protected ourselves with the 
breastplate of righteousness. We've laced up the shoes of peace to bring the good news to all who need it. We've taken up the shield of faith to extinguish the flaming arrows of the enemy. We've put on the helmet of salvation, the helmet of the Savior, and found our identity in Christ. And today we close by focusing on the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Introduction number two. The sword is our most offensive weapon in our arsenal. It's not the only piece of armor that we utilize in an offensive manner, but it is, in fact, the most offensive weapon in our arsenal. And as I stated in my first introduction, it's way past time for the church to move from just playing defense and shift into offense. Instead of just sitting back and just taking whatever's given to us, it's time for the church to boldly stand up and advance the kingdom of God into dark places as we shine the light of Jesus Christ. And really, I think the reason there's so much darkness in our land today, I doubt we would get much disagreement that we're living in dark times, but maybe there's a disagreement on the reason. Might I suggest that I believe the reason there is so much darkness in our land today is because we Christians have failed to shine his light wherever we went. If we were gonna lay the blame, we ought lay the blame at the foot of powerless pulpits and complacent Christians. We were content to live our safe Christian lives with a few of our Christian friends and enjoy our Christian meetings inside the confines of these four walls. And I confess to you today, even I, your pastor, have drifted and capitulated to the desires of the populace from time to time. No, not in a compromising, sinful manner, thank the Lord, like many are shamefully being revealed in these days, but more so in just a complacent way, failing to be as prepared for battle as I needed to be and in do so failing, or by doing so, failing to prepare you as well. Don't be so quiet. You haven't done your part all the time either. (laughs) And as we see in our land, across our great nation, yes, even right here in our backyard of Minnesota. We're seeing the effects of the church's quietness and complacency in our day. Well, this is not the first time, I remind you, dear brothers and sisters, that this has happened to the people of God. We're often so much prisoners of the moment and we think this has never happened before. Let me show you right in the scripture that we are not the first ones. We are the latest ones in 2024, but we are not the first ones who have gone our own way and given in to the pressures of society, capitulated to the requests from popularity. First Samuel chapter number 13 and verse 19. And the subject headed in my Bible, it is described as Israel without weapons. I sense within my spirit that we find ourselves in our great nation, the church of Jesus Christ, fighting wars without weapons, specifically speaking, the spiritual weapons of warfare that he's given us for this day of battle. Verse number 19 says, there were no blacksmiths in the land of Israel in those days. Another translation says, not a blacksmith could be found in all the land. What a tragic historical note of reflection and assessment of the state of Israel in that day. That there was no one who knew how to prepare the weapons of war or could train others to be prepared to do so themselves. Sounds a little bit like the land in which we live in today. He goes on to say that the Philistines wouldn't allow them for fear they would make swords and spears for the Hebrews. Isn't it interesting that the enemy is still up to the same old trick, trying to convince the church of Jesus Christ to lay down that which we've been given for the time in which we are in. 
So whenever the Israelites needed to sharpen their plowshares, their picks, their axes, their sickles, their stuff for everyday life, they had to go to a Philistine blacksmith. They had to go and ask the enemy to help them live in the day they were in. They charged money for the privilege of having their tools for the day. In verse 22, a tragic remark of the result of no blacksmiths to be found in all the land. Verse number 22, and on the day of battle, none of the people of Israel had a sword or spear. We find ourselves today living in a time where we're feeling the effects of a lack of spiritual blacksmiths in the church. There were no blacksmiths to be found because the governing authority didn't want them to make a sword for battle. They fought with what they had, but they lacked what they really needed. So a, a sub point or a recurring theme for today's message is I'm calling for the blacksmiths to be found in the land again today. I recognize it won't be for everybody here today, but I, but I need at least four or five. I need a few blacksmiths who are willing to be counted and be found in the land today. Regardless of what the powers that be are saying, we need people, men and women full of faith who will get the swords prepared for battle. You see, I don't know about how you were raised, but I learned the tools of spiritual warfare from the saints when I was young. From men and women who'd been there and done that and they'd walked with the Lord and he had heard their cry and they taught me how to be prepared. But somewhere along the line, when we got cute and fancy and we had logos and t-shirts. I'm not against them. We ordered a bunch this week, but ours say Jesus saves. <laughs> Somewhere along the line, we've abandoned the practice of spiritual apprenticeship and therefore we now find ourselves unprepared for battle today. So I believe it's time and I'm calling for blacksmiths, spiritual blacksmiths to be found in the land again today. I got one. I got one. He came to first service too, so it took him a little while, but. <laughs> Number one, look at your notes, S-W-O-R-D. We had such an outpouring of the Holy Spirit in the first service, and I trust in his sovereignty that he'll do so again in this gathering. Number one, we must study the word. The sword of the spirit, it is the word of God. And, and we've lost the, the ability, we've, we've set aside the desire, we've abandoned the practice in our land, in the church today of studying the word of God. There's a big difference, dear brothers and sisters, between studying the word and glancing quickly at it to get a cute verse that we can put up on our fridge. It's tragic that in our short attention span society where we so quickly move from one thing to the next that we've settled for a cute Pinterest picture of the Bible and we've lost the in-depth study within the context of the whole council of scripture. So we pick and choose the verses that sound good and feel good, but we don't really know what the Bible says anymore. We've got biblically illiterate Christians in the church house today. Oh, some of us know what the word says, but far too many Christians in America, more so in our nation than around the world, but we've found people within the halls of churches in our nation that believe things like God helps those who help themselves is in the Bible. Some of you are like, where well, is not? <laughs> Spoiler alert, it's not. So I wonder where have the blacksmiths, the Bible blacksmiths gone these days? The men and women of faith that we can go to with questions about scripture and who will teach us how to read the Bible for ourselves. 2 Timothy 3 and 16 says all scripture 
is God breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness, so that the purpose for the servant of God to be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Therefore, it should be no surprise that many within the body of Christ, perhaps a good amount that are here under the sound of my voice previously, you would have to admit you're not thoroughly equipped for every good work because you've not been studying the word. These days where we have no blacksmiths in the land, we see the ever deteriorating belief in the truth of God's word. Our society, tragically more so, even some preachers in churches have begun to question if all scripture is really God-breathed or just the comfy verses about the blessings of being healthy and wealthy. Study the word. Joshua 1 and 8 says, keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then, he says, you'll be prosperous and successful. So clearly there are elements of God's grace that gives us prosperity and success. But really both of those things must be viewed in the context of the whole of Scripture. Because what is true here in America must also be true over in Ethiopia for it is the same gospel. So the size of your house is probably an incomplete picture of prosperity when we consider the billions of people beyond our beloved nation. And even more importantly, even if we were to only read one verse and remove it from the whole council of scripture, the first part of it says meditate on it day and night so that you'll be careful to do everything written in it. That means the Bible must be part of every day of our lives and not just the Sunday sermon from the preacher. This is why we see so many Christians suffering from spiritual malnutrition today. If the only time your word is open is when I'm preaching, you're going to be under, you're going to be malnutritioned, undernourished, you're going to have a problem. Because once a week, who are we kidding? Many ain't making it even once a week. Once a week is not enough to sustain you. 50 meals throughout the year will leave you scrunt and skinny, daunt and skinny, bad. Dr. Donnell will tell me later what word I could have used and it'll be better. But I want to remind you here today an an important thing to mention when it comes to the study of Scripture, studying the Word. When we study the Word of God, it's more to change our own lives than to point our finger at everyone around us. Studying the Word is not to find a verse that you can get your neighbor with. Studying the word is about allowing the Holy Spirit to highlight things on the heart of our own lives. Why? Because scripture ought to be more of a mirror for our own life than a window into other people's lives. Or probably we like to use that as a magnifying glass into their lives. One preacher said it this way, many Christians have a PhD in other people's sins, but a GED in their own. I don't think we offer that degree at North Central, Dr. Darnell, but that's what people got. For the sake of time, I've got to move on due to five points and wanting to pray. But I just want to emphasize before I move to point two, the importance of this first point because it lays the foundation for the rest of of the points. And here we're seeing in churches across our great nation that when you skip this first point, when you eliminate the study of the word, when you take your messages from the cover of Time magazine or anything else for sale at the grocery store, there's a tendency for the rest of the points to get wonky in our lives as well. Instead, we must be like the Bereans in Acts chapter 17, who the Bible says they studied the word each day to see if the messages they heard were even true. Number two, after we study the word, or part of this study of the word is to wrestle in prayer. It's to wrestle in prayer. As those in the room watching online, anyone under the sound of my voice knows, when you study the word, 
sooner or later, you're going to come across some things that require a wrestling in prayer. Things that are going to confront your flesh. Things that are going to be hard to comprehend. And it is only through time spent with the Lord in your prayer closet that you receive revelation for your life. But you see, here in the Church of America, we've lost the commitment to travail in prayer. In fact, many here today have never even heard of such prayer. Your experience with prayer has been limited to praying before meals or Sunday prayers from the preacher or perhaps an emergency prayer such as, God, don't let me get this speeding ticket that I have earned. You see, we feel the effects of a prayerless church today, which only highlights my previous desire. And therefore, once again, I'm calling for a return of spiritual blacksmiths who will be prepared for the battle ahead. Genesis chapter 32 and 24, the Bible says, Jacob was left alone. Sometimes you've just got to disconnect. You've got to get away. You've got to find time to just meet with the Lord himself. And the Bible says a man wrestled with him until daybreak. This angel of the Lord had, had shown up on the scene. In verse 25, when the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that his hip was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. And then the man said, let me go for it is daybreak. But Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Friends, this is what it looks like to travail in prayer. This type of prayer is driven by intensity and perseverance. It's about praying as hard as you can for as long as you can until you completely pour yourself out and receive God's peace. Intense travailing in prayer. It adds physical and emotional expressions to the intellectual words and expressions of our prayer. So where are all the men and women of faith who are committed to these spiritual disciplines themselves and then also willing to help others learn the spiritual trades as well? Maybe you're here and you say, I truly am a person of prayer. That's awesome. But my question for you then is, are you willing to teach others how to pray and wrestle with God as well? I remind you, it was the saints at an early age who taught me how to travail in prayer that brought me over and said, son, let me teach you the ways of the Lord. Colossians 4 and 12 says, Epaphras, who's one of you, a servant of Christ Jesus, sends greetings. I love this. He's always wrestling in prayer for you. Look, I'm all for it. Cute and quick prayers, and we ought to pray about everything, but, but are we willing to wrestle in prayer for other people? The Bible says that his commitment to wrestling in prayer for them, the point was this, so that you may stand firm in all the will of God, mature and fully assured. Here we have this example of someone who was willing to wrestle in prayer for others so they would stand firm in the will of God. We love to blame other people when they, they fall away, when they turn their back on God, when they walk away. But I wonder this morning, was there any blacksmith that was willing to wrestle in prayer for them? Could it be that so many are no longer secure? in the will of God because the church of Jesus Christ, the people of God, yes, even the pastors in the pulpits have surrendered their call and walked away from wrestling in prayer. I'll preach a little bit more on this in point four for sure, but friends, make no mistake, I'm doing everything I can this morning to call us back to prayer to call forth the blacksmiths again who know how to be prepared for battle that can make ready the weapons of war in our day. But I remind you that prayer is not about our power. It's about accessing his. Prayer doesn't make you angry at your neighbor. It'll make you angry at the devil, give you this righteous indignation that there is still a cause that's worth standing up and being counted for, but We've got to be people of prayer. 
I've found that in my own life, the greatest moments of strength in my life are directly tied to my level of surrender in prayer. It was in prayer that Jesus himself uttered the famous words, Father, not my will, but thine be done. It was in prayer that the son surrendered his will to the father. Perhaps we today are unwilling to surrender our will to the father because we're unwilling to spend time with him in prayer. This week, we were confronted with disastrous news that one of our partners, Dave Dudley, was diagnosed with brain cancer, and then they found many tumors all over his body. So we began to pray, and we're continuing to pray because that's our responsibility, to do battle in the heavenly realms, that, that what we don't see is even more than what we do see. It's even more real than what we do see. And I want you to know, friends, we are committed to wrestling in prayer, for we know that's where the spiritual warfare is won. Yesterday, I made my way over, and we saw signs of a turnaround. I'm able to speak a little bit and walk on his own instead of the wheelchair. But, but I want you to know we are not letting up. We're not taking our foot off the pedal, pedal. In fact, we're putting the pedal to the metal, and we're pressing in even more because we're committed to wrestling in prayer. Five people are committed as well, but that's all right. Number three, we've got to obey God's command. S-W-O, we've got to obey God's commands. I wonder, friends, where has holiness gone these days? Sin in our society has been around since the Garden of Eden. I'm not referring to why are those around us living lives of sin. I'm asking within the church of Jesus Christ, where has holiness gone? We, as the people of God, have abandoned the call to holiness. To our own demise, we now prefer to follow our feelings rather than obey God's commands. We talk a lot about grace and love, but we often skip over obedience and truth. But I'd like to remind everyone under the sound of my voice that it was Jesus himself who said in John chapter 14 and verse 15, if you love me, keep my commands. Notice what Jesus did not say. If you love me, it's okay if you do whatever you want because I know how you feel. Jesus didn't say, if you love me, it's all right if you sleep around a little bit because you feel like it. I know your heart. He said, if you love me, keep my commands. In this social media age, where the amount of likes that you get on a post, we, we have this comparison contest with one another. It's made us susceptible to be swayed in popularity contests. Shifting our moral values upon the loudest at the microphone or the emotionally sensitive experience that is shared online. And while we ought to feel our feelings, it's more important that we view those feelings through the lens of Scripture through the truth of God's word. Hebrews 4 and 12 reads like this, for the word of God is living and active. It's sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joint and marrow. It judges the very thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Now I get it, friends. There are so many things that are quite tricky to navigate these days, things that sound true, but doesn't that make sense that the lie of the enemy will always come cloaked with an element of truth? And therefore, we need to return to looking through, evaluating, examining everything through the lens of God's word because it's only his word that can get down into the very nth degree of what's really going on. On. And the further we drift from obedience to God's word, the more challenging it's going to get to determine right from wrong. But I remind you, friends, in Scripture, there are two times to obey God's commands. Number one, when you feel like it, and number two, when you don't. 
Those are the two times that according to scripture, we're called to obey God. Now I'm thankful in our land and in our day for this emphasis on a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. But I think our focus on the personal decision has led us to overlook the key, uh, a key to our victory here in this life, in this spiritual warfare is found within the context of Christian community. It's in the context of community, being with one another, that we are made better. Proverbs 27 and 17 says, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. My dad says, we love to quote that verse, but we fail to recall that iron sharpening iron means sparks are flying. Because most of us are not familiar as much today as maybe we were before with the process of of the blacksmiths, they would heat up the piece of metal. It would go from orange and eventually turn white as it would continue to get hotter and hotter. And they would have the anvil, the the, the standard of truth, the the hard item, the, the hot metal would be placed on the anvil and then the hammer could beat that hot metal into submission, into form. They could shape it into a spear. They could shape it into a sword, all different kinds of things. And I remember going to these kind of wild west enactments. It was called Black Lake Camp when I was growing up. And I would go and see the blacksmith and I loved watching the sparks fly. Sometimes they'd hit it and kind of come a little bit further, like take another step back. Why? When, when you're moving this piece of metal, when you're shaping it into all that it can become, sparks are going to fly. But today, we rarely see people willing to let sparks fly and stay in community. We like to let sparks fly and move on to where we'll be accepted for who we really are which is really code for let me do whatever I want to do. Amen. If you don't say it on this point, it's going to be a long rest of the message. I'm just giving you fair warning today. You see, when confrontation happens, we really find out if we believe in obedience to God's commands or just enjoying the convenience of his blessings. So once again, I'm calling for the spiritual blacksmiths to rise up today in the church. I'm calling for men and women of faith willing to stand up and be counted because we're living in a society that has within it built in opposition to anyone in positions of authority. And while that's troublesome when it shows itself against people speaking, uh, you know, acting out against police officers, While it's troublesome, I could give you example after example of people saying, well, who does the pastor think he is for speaking the truth of God's word? It's most concerning to me when I see people claim, well, who does God think he is to tell me what to do? But friends, that's always the natural progression of our resistance to anyone and everything in a position of authority. So there we have the most grievous example of those who stand up against God's commands instead of surrendering our will to his. And I'm calling once again for spiritual blacksmiths to be found in the land today. Number four, we rebuke the enemy. I remind you, we're talking about the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Look back at the life of Jesus. We not only study the word, We wrestle in prayer, we obey God's commands, and it gives us the authority to rebuke the enemy. Jesus did this time and time again with the word of God. Remember Satan, if you grew up in church, you might remember this, if you're newer, I'll fill you in. Satan came to Jesus, he was out there in prayer and fasting, he showed up in the wilderness and Satan was like, hey, why don't you turn this stone into bread? He brought temptation Jesus' way and three times in a row, Jesus responded. It's still a great response for us, by the way. Jesus said, it is written. Here's the reason many Christians today can't say it is written. We don't have a clue what's written. We skipped point one. We hadn't studied the word. We just read the refrigerator magnet. And then if we did study the word, we sure didn't wrestle in prayer. We gave up when it got tough. And 
you know, one of the biggest complaints we see in our land today is that preachers and Christians aren't actually doing what they're talking about. There's no obedience to God's commands. It's no wonder that we fail when it comes to rebuking the enemy because we've abandoned the practices that led us to that point. But if we'll return to studying the word and if we'll return to wrestling in prayer and if we'll return to obeying God's commands, then I believe we can utilize the word of God and rebuke the enemy. But I've said each week, Dr. Darnell, Pastor Josiah, we've said each week, your neighbor is not your enemy. Unless you live in an HOA, then that's possible. I'm just... Just saying, it's, it's possible. We've been saying your spouse is not your enemy. Come on, we've been saying the Packers are not your enemy. Come on, we've been saying the Republicans and the Democrats are not your enemy. What is Ephesians 6 and 12? I've read it every week, but want it on the record here in this point, in this context, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. But I admit to you today, dear brothers and sisters, that this is something I've really had to remind myself about this week. That our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Perhaps some of you, maybe many, are not aware of what's transpired this week in our Minnesota state legislature. Well, it goes back even a year before, but I've been made keenly aware of what's happened. And and I also just want to mention that I'm fully cognizant of the reality that in a church of our size located here in Minnesota, there's a wide variety of voting preferences and voting history within our congregation. Most would vote primarily either for Republicans or Democrats. It's called DFL here in Minnesota. Some would abstain from voting. Some would choose third parties. Some would do write-in options. And for many decades, the differences in those voting preferences could largely be attributed to opinions on taxation and benefits provided by the government. But something has shifted here this week in Minnesota. Now it's 2024, so I'd like to remind everybody, I'm not even referring to our upcoming presidential election in November. I'm simply talking about beloved Minnesota, where we live, where God has placed us in this season. Even though we're back to winter season, it's a season. (laughs) My Facebook popped up two years ago. We got the same kind of snow in the same period. We just had so, so great of a winter, we forget that it's still March and that happens. I'm talking about Minnesota. Something has taken place in our state legislature that goes beyond a lack of morality in our state and it impacts the legality in our church. Now, most people don't want me to speak about this. Some pastors even said, be careful, you're online. Well, zoom in so you can get me clearly. Uh. My comments are not meant to disparage any individual or government party affiliation because politicians are people too. They're the ones that cast the vote, but the enemy is the one at work, the prince of darkness, those principalities, rulers of the dark age. That's, I cannot ignore, however, that when it comes to this recent move, the vote to remove and keep removed religious liberty from the Minnesota Human Rights Act, I cannot ignore the reality that only members of the DFL party voted to do such a thing. Now, I will admit that in the past, if you look over my history, I don't really speak on politics very often. Labels are are confusing and bills are labeled in different things. But Dr. Darnell last year is the one that said, we don't even know what a woman is. So here I go, Dr. Darnell, I'm with you. We say, yeah, I wasn't pausing for you to clap. I was just letting it sink in. We're battle ready. This Minnesota Human Rights Act sounds nice and and all that, but it has to do with hiring practices even within the church when it comes to gender identity. 
We also have a state licensed daycare, and I don't really know how else to say, but I will stand before God as the person on record, as the leader of even said daycare, and give an account to God, and far be it from me if myself or our board turns our back on that which the enemy would want to bring in and influence our children. I'm not bringing hype or trying to scare you. What I'm saying is you can vote how you want at the state house, but we're gonna operate the way we must according to the Bible in God's house. So I personally watch the House Judiciary, Finance, and Civil Law Committee committee meeting where different religious leaders, by the way, Muslim imams and Catholic priests mostly, spoke to restore this protection for every religious group. But their remarks were greeted with, in my estimation, deep hostility flowing from different elected officials, and as I mentioned, only from the DFL party. So what is our proper response? I'm trying to exemplify it for you today. I'm not demonizing every individual in the Minnesota DFL party, but hear me clearly. I am calling for every member of our state leadership to restore religious liberty that has been afforded to us by God and our constitution. So if you didn't vote for these leaders, I want to encourage you. You can write a letter and let them know how you feel. If you did vote for these leaders, you too can write a letter and let them know how you feel. Might I add, if you did vote for them, perhaps your voice will be heard even louder if they hear that although you voted for them, this policy goes against your conscience and what you believe for religious liberty, for churches to be able to determine and govern themselves without interference from the state house which I believe is part of a plan for the enemy to hinder the voice of the body of Christ. So what are we gonna do about it? Number one, we're gonna pray. Number two, we're gonna challenge things in court. And number three, we're gonna vote what we value most in this next election cycle. That's the American way. We're not gonna whine and complain. We're not gonna hem and haw. We're not gonna make threats. We're gonna do those three simple things. We're gonna pray that God would do what only he can do. We're gonna make our voice heard by by challenging it in court, by sending letters to them, and then vote what we value most. This is not only the American way, I believe it is the Christian way. And so many are wondering, we get questions all the time. People asking my wife, How, what are you doing in school boards and those kind of things? Let me just wanna provide a resource to you if you'd like to receive it on your way out today. Uh, we're calling for prayer in our nation and state, but we've listed the information, or this was given to us and I'm passing along from another pastor, uh, information of different leaders within the government, the House Speaker, the Senate Majority Leader. I'm talking about right here in Minnesota, House Minority Leader, Senate Minority Leader, the Governor. Um, I don't think we have Lieutenant Governor's info on here. By the way, I saw how she picked her brackets for March Madness. I'm just gonna say it. I believe that was the quiet part out loud when she said she picked her bracket based upon which states had abortion access. They're not even saying women's reproductive rights anymore. They're bragging about it on social media. So we should probably add that email. But those emails and phone numbers are on there so that you can contact them and say, I don't agree with removing religious liberty. Listen, I said it at the top of this, friends. This isn't about morality in our state. This is about legality in our churches. People have the American right to sin and throw their own life away. But the moment they try to change how we're going to operate and worship our God and conduct our business, I can't help but pause and take a moment and speak up and raise my voice and say, this is not right. Also, on the back of it, because you're like, what would I say? There's a sample letter that you could fill in. Dear representative, I'm troubled by the removal of a constitutionally protected freedom, the freedom of religious expression. A religious institution's stance on gender identity should be determined by each institution, not mandated by the state government. This is a core freedom of our state and of our nation, and it came under direct attack this week. So you can get that on your way out, and I just want to encourage you to do that very thing. We're going to keep praying. By the way, pray for your pastors. Tomorrow afternoon, we're going to be joining with hundreds of other religious leaders. This is not just Assemblies of God pastors, 250 of those. We're going to join with hundreds of other, like I said, Muslim imams, Catholic priests, uh, men and women of faith, religious leaders, Uh, Yes, even of different faith, but pray for us as we gather at the Capitol tomorrow and we pray for the state legislature to reverse 
their decision and restore religious liberty in the Minnesota Human Rights Act of Minnesota, which I already said in Minnesota. Amen? Now, one more thing upon this point before I move to number five and pray for you, even though our time is gone, I'll be, you know, it doesn't matter. Don't forget, another way to say this, let me highlight what we end with really matters most and we'll get to that, but even what I end on this point, let me remind you that revival has far more to do with our own house than it does the White House. Or the governor's mansion, but that doesn't rhyme with house. You know, I was like, revival has more to do with your mansion. You're like, I live in an apartment. That's why I said your house, white house. Just go with the preacher illustration, right? We can control the spiritual temperature of our own life and in our home. And so we vote our values. We let our voice be heard, but we don't lose sight of where our help comes from. The Bible says our help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. Number five, the last thing, if we study the word and we uh, wrestle in prayer and we obey God's commands and through the authority of God's word, we rebuke the enemy. The last thing we do, and we see it throughout scripture, we declare the victory. To be clear, this is spiritual victory that I'm referring to that we are guaranteed in Christ. Come on, this is not mumbo jumbo, think nice thoughts and quote unquote manifest your better life or a Super Bowl win for the Vikings. We want that, but that's not what we're talking about. This is not some spiritual malarkey that denies the reality of the score of your kid's hockey game. I'm just going to declare the victory. You lost. Your kid's not good at sports. Save your money. That was a word for somebody. That was not in the nine o'clock. That was just a word for somebody. But we are called to declare the victory. My kid's going to be in the NBA. He's five foot two. He's going nowhere. We were watching March Madness yesterday with my son. He was a little kid out there. And my son's like, well, how tall is that little kid? About my height? I said, son, he's 6'3". We looked it up. He's like, he's tiny. I said, because all of his friends are 6'8 and 7'4". <laughs> anyway, I don't know what I'm talking about. But, I mean, I know what I'm talking about. I don't know why I'm talking about it. Okay. This is declaring the victory is rather about serving notice on the enemy and encouraging the body of Christ. It says we have, in fact, read the whole book. We know what's going to happen. We know that one day our king will return. He'll be riding on a white horse and coming with him will be all the armies of heaven. The sky is going to split and the trumpet's going to sound and we're going to hear him come for his church. We know how the story ends. That's the victory that we have the joy, privilege, and responsibility to declare. We declare the victory. As we come to a close of this sermon series, I'm reminded that the word of God has, is both logos and, or logos and rhema. Logos is the timeless word of God. We've been given the, the written word of God and it's true forever, but rhema is something that just comes alive through the ministry of the Holy Spirit in your life at just one moment. I say one is the timeless word of God and the other becomes the timely word of God. It's always been true. Ephesians 6 has always been true. I've grown up in church. I, I've understood. I can recite the armor of God, but something has happened within the body of believers here at Celebration, something that has happened in the life even of your pastor that these words are not just on the printed page. They're not just the Logos, the timeless word of God. They've become a rhema. They've become right now for me. And I sense it's true in your life as well, that this is the moment we were made for. And I confess with all the challenges that we faced within the last week, I haven't even mentioned or even brought up online. One of my pastor friends on Monday, I received devastating news. A, a young man in his 60s, a pastor friend from Seattle, suddenly died of a heart attack and gone way too soon. We've, I don't know how else to say it. It's been a week for the Ross family. It's been a week for many gathered here today. It's been a week for many in the body of Christ and I don't know how else to say it, but I, I believe the enemy has given me opportunity on a number of days this week to shrink back in the face of opposition. But there's something about the strength I've been receiving throughout this series that made me stand up on the inside in a new way this week. And as we've been talking about being bad already, we now have the opportunity to find out if we're for real or not. 
When someone dies an untimely death, when someone gets a bad report from the doctor, when the government act, when a government act goes against what we believe, do we pack up and retreat or do we stand up and believe? Hebrews 10 and 39 says, we are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed, but of those who have faith and are saved. So I believe this is our moment as we get ready to close and I pray for you in a few moments. Looking back at 1 Samuel chapter number 13, that said there were no blacksmiths to be found in the land because the Philistine enemy prohibited. I'm calling once again in these moments for the spiritual blacksmiths to be found in our day. For clarity, this sermon is not about buying a bunch of bullets. I mean, that's fine if you do. Get a coupon, you'll save money. Ain't nothing wrong. That's still legal. Buy them up. Doesn't bother me. But Ephesians 6 is not talking about weapons of this world. It's talking about spiritual weapons to bring back the blacksmiths in Jesus' name. I wonder, as we look around our nation, I'm wondering where have all the blacksmiths gone? Have we simply retreated to the privacy of our own homes? Have we reluctantly given in to the pressure of the enemy? Have we surrendered territory that God has called us to occupy? Where have all the blacksmiths gone today? The men and women of faith, the seasoned saints who will make ready the weapons of spiritual warfare. The ones that are not the weapons of this world. It's more than whatever they said, rakes and sickles and other stuff I don't know about. Will we make ready the spiritual weapons of war? I wanna read to you Ephesians chapter six one more time, this time from the message translation and I'm gonna pray. I know our time is long gone. Ephesians 6, 13 to 18 from the message translation. He says, be prepared. I pray each and every one of us are more prepared today than we were two months ago. Be prepared. For you're up against far more than you can handle on your own. Come on, but thanks be to God, we don't have to handle it on our own. He's given us the helper, Holy Spirit. He's given us spiritual weapons of war. He says, take all the help you can get. Every weapon God has issued so that when it's all over but the shouting, you'll still be on your feet. Come on, I'm just believing that one day even Upper Midwest, Upper Midwest, Norwegian, Lutherans will have a little bit of shouting. I'll settle for a cymbal on the drums. I don't care. He says, truth, righteousness, peace, faith, and salvation are more than words, but you've got to learn how to apply them. You'll need them throughout your life. Yeah, you need them on Sunday, but you're going to need them on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday and 2025 and 2030 and 20. 50 until Jesus comes back. You're going to need these weapons that God has given to us. You'll need them throughout your life. His word is an indispensable weapon. He says in the same way, prayer is essential in this ongoing warfare. I think some of the struggles that we've been through in our nation and in our land over the last couple of years, hopefully have reminded the people of God, hopefully have awakened the body of Christ to be reminded that prayer is still essential in ongoing warfare. He says, pray hard and long, travail. Pray for your brothers and sisters. Keep your eyes open. I love this. He said, keep each other's spirits up so that no one falls behind or drops out. If you're able, would you stand here this morning? I love the way he finishes there. He says, so that when it's all over, 
but the shouting. You know what that is? That's a declaration of victory. I want you to know that it's biblical, right? Hebrew word for praise. There's even this deal where you can let out a shout even before the enemy knows he's been whooped. Now, if you're not from the South, you might not know what whooped is, but that means beaten soundly amongst other things. But I'm just saying, that's one of them. <laughs> so sometimes there's something that happens when we can vocalize. We, in other words, it's not over yet, but it's already done. That, that's what we recognize. That, that's what we see. It's not over yet, but it's already done. And that's what I want to come to pray. That's what I want to come to declare. As we even declare this victory, I want to pray a commissioning of sorts. As we call for the blacksmiths to be found in the land again, not to shrink back because the enemy says, oh, don't do that. Not because pressure says that's not cool anymore, but men and women who say, I'll be ready and I'll train others to be ready to take a stand against the devil's schemes in the dark days. So if you're ready, would you lift your hands toward heaven as I pray for you today? Father, you see your people that are gathered here. In a moment, we're gonna to declare together that the battle belongs to you. But Father, I ask right now, raise up blacksmiths in the land again. Men and women who know how to study the Bible. Men and women who are willing to wrestle in prayer. Men and women who are committed to obeying all your commands. Men and women who full of the Holy Ghost can say, I rebuke the enemy in Jesus' name. Men and women who know that it's not done, but it's already over. And they can say, we declare victory in Jesus' name. So Father, I'm praying for men and women here today, young and old, light and dark, rich and poor, everyone under the sound of my voice. Oh God, I'm asking that you'd raise up warriors for spiritual battle today. That God, we know that no weapon formed against us will prosper, that we've been given the victory in Jesus' name. So we would declare we're going to win in Jesus' name. Come on, let's lift our voice to Him today. Let's declare we've been given victory. Spiritual warfare. In Jesus' name. We hope that you learned something from this message and are able to apply it to your life. If you gave your life to Jesus for the first time or the tenth time, reach out to us on Facebook or email us at info at celebrationchurch.net. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you again next week.